This is the second in my series of videos on Marxist theory of the determination of the rate of profit. And this one, I'm looking at the effect of the passing of time. This is what Marx says. Now we have seen that it is a law of capitalist production, that its development is attended by a relative decrease of variable in relation to constant capital and consequently to the total capital set in motion. This is just another way of saying that owing to the distinctive methods of production developing in the capitalist system, the same number of labourers, i.e. the same quantity of labour power, set in motion by variable capital of a given value, operate, work up and productively consume in the same time span an ever-increasing quantity of the means of labour, machinery and fixed capital of all sorts, raw and auxiliary materials and consequently a constant capital of ever-increasing value. This argument rests on the following assumptions. Firstly, that the rate of surplus value remains roughly the same over time. Secondly, a material growth in the means of production implies an increase in the value of the means of production, even if the growth of value is slower. First assumption is fairly safe. The second assumption is less certain and Marx makes provision for counteracting tendencies which may prevent it occurring. And I'm going to see how these different assumptions panned out in the 30 to 35 years after Capital was published in Britain. Now, what about the rate of surplus value? Although the rate of surplus value isn't constant, it changes from time to time. It tends to change within a narrow range of what Marx assumed, or at least within 50% of what Marx assumed. In Marx assumed 100% rate of surplus value. Actually, in 1863, when he was writing it, the rate was 64% in Britain. One does actually see situations where the split is 50-50. That is to say 100% rate of uh, surplus value because he divides the surplus over the variable capital. But what you don't see is situations where the split is 90%, 10% of the share of income, or 10%, 90%. This means that his initial argument to the effect that the total wage bill will act roughly as an index for the number of workers is basically sound. He's using it only as an index for the number of workers in order to obtain the ratio of dead to living labour. Now that is basically sound. This shows how it evolved in the period after capital was written. The red line is the rate of surplus value. It peaked at about 70% just after 1870 and then settled at around 50% by 1900. So there was a bit of a decline, um, arguably an effect of two things which were taking place over that period. The slow down in the migration from the countryside to the towns, which reduced the reserve army of labour, and also the strengthening of trade union organisation, which occurred in the last part of the 19th century. But that's only an 11% fall in the rate of surplus value. That wouldn't have made a big difference to the rate of profit. OK. Where's the source of this? Where do I get my data? Well, there's a very useful database published by the Bank of England at the address I give there, and it's called the Millennium of Macroeconomic Data. And some of the data really does go back 
to the 11th century. Um, certainly got lots of data from the 19th century onwards. Now what about the rate of profit? The bottom graph here is the rate of profit on capital in Britain. The top graph is the um, capital to labour ratio, C over V. And what do you notice is there's no strong tendency. They both oscillate. Um, the, the rate of profit oscillates but stays fairly constant and then a bit of a dip towards the start of the 20th century which probably, the, as I said, the, the spread of industrial unionism or general unionism at the time. But this is the important point. There's a 61% negative correlation between the organic composition and rate of profit. They're roughly mirror images of one another. Not exactly, because fluctuations in the rate of surplus value also affect the rate of profit. But what does the 61% mean? What does a 61% correlation coefficient mean? It means that 61% of the change in the profit ratio, profit rate, was due to the organic composition of capital. And only 39% of the changes were due to the rate of surplus value. So it follows that C of V over V was the most important cause of the change in profit rates. And that was one of the results that Mark derive, derives from his arithmetic examples, that C over V will dominate in determining the rate of profit. But the next thing to notice is that C over V, the top line, fluctuates with no clear up or downward trend. Now that wasn't quite what Marx expected. And if from 1880 it actually declined. So the expected rise in the organic composition wasn't occurring and from 1880 to 1900 it actually fell. Why could this have happened? It either meant that the mass of machinery put in motion by UK workers must have declined, which is one possibility, or what Marx called the cheapening of the elements of constant capital must have been in operation. Now let's see which of those is the more plausible explanation. To do that we have to look at what may, made up constant capital. What does Ma Marx mean by the mass of constant capital? And he actually means it in a very physical sense. It's the mass of machinery that is being operated by each worker. And it was certainly the case that some machines were greatly miniaturized during those 20 years. There were huge improvements in the miniaturization of motive power. In 1886, this was a state-of-the-art power source. It's a steam engine which operates or operated um, Tower Bridge, which uh, compressed the water which operated the hydraulic rams. It was a 150 horsepower steam engine built by Armstrong's in the mid-1880s. A few years later, Parsons was developing steam turbines. And this is a tur Parsons turbine built five years later. 120 kilowatt electric generator. Now 120 kilowatt is equal to 160 horsepower. So it's slightly more powerful than the steam engine but it's very much smaller. This is the actual turbine, the area within the red. The, the rest of it is the electric generator, which is not a primary power source. And it's very much more compact. 
than the Armstrong engine built five years earlier. So it was the case that certain very important elements of constant capital, primary power sources, actually underwent a reduction in mass during the, the period between when capital was written and the end of the 19th century. The actual mass of machinery reduced, whilst its ability to perform work increased. So the mass of constant capital in some areas went down. Now, what does Marx mean by the technical composition of capital? I'll go into that later, but look at another area, shipping, which was one of the major sectors of the British economy. Ships became bigger. Steamships were becoming bigger and more powerful. So you have to consider things like how much did the average tonnage of a cargo ship rise? How much did the average crew, ship, crew size change? Were crew sizes going up or were they going down? How much did the price per ton of ship that the ship owners had to pay go up or go down over those years? Now, let's take a couple of examples. The first one is a typical steamship of the 1870s. I've got the details from the database of time-built shipyards, ships, sorry, ships built in the time shipyards. Now, it was a 1,200-ton ship and had a 120-horsepower engine. It seems pretty small by modern standards, but it was a steamship. Uh, eventually served served as a coastal steamer around the Austra Australian coast. Now let's go forward 30 years to 1900. And this is a typical ship that was being built on the Clyde at that time. It's the Ernst Vorman, um, sold I think from a Clyde ship builder to a German ship owner and eventually became wrecked off the coast of southwest Africa. Now that ship, filling the same niche in the market, had more horsepower, 257 horsepower. It seems tiny by modern standards. Um, and was a 4,000 ton ship. And that little 4,000 ton ship, or what seems a little 4,000 ton ship now, actually served on the line from Germany to South Africa. So, there's clearly been an increase in the size of the average ship. What about crews? Well, what was happening over that period was the transition from sailing ships to steamships. When Marx wrote Capital, most international cargo was still carried on sailing ships. By 1900, most new cargo ships were steamships. Sailing ships still existed, but they had lost their dominant position. And this meant a big reduction in the crew requirement per tonne of displacement. A sailing ship requires enough crew to operate all the sails. And this is what Marx called a rise in the technical composition of capital. Fewer workers for the same mass in tons of the means of production. So a sailing ship to, to steamship is a particularly good example. But it's not just a matter of the technical composition. It's a matter of what are the value of these machines? Is the value of these, machine, these machines going up or down? The technical composition of capital, as I say, relates to the physical mass 
of means of production used by each worker and real and it could be measured in tons per worker the value composition of capital relates to the value of means of production used by each worker and it's approximated by the monetary ratio c over v now when he talks about the organic composition of capital by which he means the ratio of dead to living labor it is the value composition in so far as this is caused by the technical composition that is to say he's excluding changes due to wage rises and inflation which may cause c over v to deviate from the what is driven by the technical composition now we know the technical composition in shipping rose but did the value composition could the owner of the cheviot the 15 well 1500 ton ship built or 1200 ton ship built in 1850 buy a 4000 ton one in 1900 using the depreciation funds that he had set aside each year that's to say with no net accumulation on the owner's part just using the same sum of capital could he end up with a bigger and better ship 30 years later well somewhat better but let's have a look at whether we can get a figure on that to do that you would need a combined steel and shipbuilding productivity to grow at four percent a year if that was the case he could have got a ship at 4,000 tons 30 years later. In fact, productive view is a bit less. I've searched a source, which I cited in my paper, um, which says between the 1860s and the early 1890s, the price of British iron ships declined by about 40%. The fall in iron prices and the improvements in building technology were of approximately equal importance, explaining the price decline whilst the rising wages offset about half their combined effect. Well, that is either, depending what, it's, he's slightly vague about half, half, half the combined effect, um, where that's either a 60% fall disregarding um, changes in wages, or perhaps he meant an 80% uh, fall in the value. Over 25 years, that's about 1.8% a year. Not enough to buy such a larger ship, but so, uh, not enough to buy a 4,000 ton ship, but maybe a 3,000 ton ship. But if we look at the stats on the organic composition of capital, between 1865 and 1895, over those 30 years, the organic composition of capital was falling at about 1.4% a year. If the general rise in productivity was as much in Department 1 across the whole economy as was occurring in shipbuilding, at what that, that is to say 1.8%, that is more than enough to account for the decline in the value of constant capital. The cheapening rate was going on at 1.8%. The actual value of the stock was falling at 1.4% therefore the actual value of the stock could fall but the physical mass could rise because of some there's 4% or 0.4% a year excess productivity which could go into creating a larger physical stock what does Marx say about this everything said in part one of this book about factors which raise the rate of profit while the rate of surplus value remains the same or regardless of the rate of surplus value belongs here here also with respect to the total capital that the value of constant capital does not increase in the same proportion as its material value for instance the quantity of cotton worked up by a single European spinner in a modern factory has grown tremendously compared to the quantity worked by a European spinner with a spinning wheel. 
yet the value of the worked up cotton hasn't grown in the same proportion to its mass. The same applies to machinery and other fixed capital. In short, the same development which increases the mass of constant capital in relation to variable reduces the value of its elements as a result of the increased productivity of labour and therefore prevents the value of ca constant capital, though it continually increases, from increasing at the same rate as its material volume. He goes on to say, the mass of the elements of constant capital may even increase whilst its value remains the same or falls. Well, that did appear to be the case in Britain from 1880 to 1900. So, what did he get right? He got right the inverse relationship between organic composition and profitability. That's something you could only deduce if the labour theory of value is your starting point and if the labour theory of value is correct. And he gives an account of how the organic composition of capital can fall and the technical composition of capital rise when, as was the case in the late 19th century, there's a steady rise in, in labour productivity in what he calls Department 1, the section of the economy producing means of production. But one's left with the feeling that that's not quite what he expected. He seemed to have regarded the cheapening of constant capital as an exception rather than the rule since it would be offset by continuing capital accumulation. Now, I'm going to put the stuff on the rate of capital accumulation and its effect into the next section, because each section here is getting quite long. So I'm going to stop this video here and move on to the accumulation of capital in the next video.